Hello and welcome. I'm Geeta Mohan and you're watching World Today. The Israel-Palestine war has shown how divided our world is today, that the international community has not been able to speak in unison on the October 7th Hamas attack and on Israel's military response in Gaza that has led to thousands of deaths. For more than 75 years, disputes between Israelis and Palestinians have proved impossible to reconcile with the world powers taking opposite sides. Global divisions have only intensified and the disagreements have been on display at the United Nations, which is debating whether to call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza or not. United Nations Security Council failed to adopt a resolution on the ongoing situation in Gaza after two competing draft resolutions were rejected by member states. The August House also became a diplomatic war zone with representatives of Israel and Palestine firing salvos against each other. Nothing can justify the killing of a single Palestinian child. Nothing. Nothing at all. Why not feel a sense of urgency to end our killing? Nothing can, as I said, justify war crimes. You are setting us back 80 years by trying to justify what Israel is doing now. Israel is not at war with human beings. We are at war with monsters. When reading this resolution, Hamas seems to be missing in action. The drafters of the resolution claim to be concerned about peace, yet the depraved Murders who initiated this war are not even mentioned in the resolution, not even mentioned. They see each one of you as puppet. Two draft resolutions respectively proposed by the United States and Russia on the ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict failed to pass in the United Nations Security Council. The U.S. draft condemned all acts of violence and hostilities against civilians and reaffirmed the inherent right of all states to individual and collective self-defense and urged all parties to fully comply with international law. It also called for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages and demanded that all states seize arms, exports, to militias and terrorist organizations that threaten regional peace and security, including Hamas. However, the resolution did not call for a durable ceasefire and did not urge Israel to rescind its ultimatum regarding northern Gaza. The draft failed to pass owing to a negative vote by permanent Security Council members, China and Russia. What we oppose is that the draft resolution is evasive on the most urgent issue of ending the hostility. It has never been able to call for an immediate ceasefire in clear and unambiguous terms. The second draft resolution led by Russia called for an immediate, durable and fully respected humanitarian ceasefire condemned all violence and hostilities against civilians, including attacks by Hamas and urged Israel to rescind its orders for the withdrawal of civilians from northern Gaza. The text did not reach a sufficient number of votes to be adopted. Four council members voted in favor, namely China, Gabon, Russia and the UAE, while the US and UK voted no and nine other members abstained. For a resolution to be adopted, it must be supported by at least nine members of the council. A significant legal problem in the draft is the reference to the right to self-defense, which was confirmed by the International Court in its advisory opinion of 2000, is inadmissible when we are talking about an occupying power. Israel regarding the Palestinian territories is precisely that. We see no point in supporting a document whose aim is solely one thing, to serve the geopolitical interests of Security Council members. The U.S. response to the UNSC resolutions amid this conflict is in line with its historical use of its veto power to block any resolutions that might be critical of Israel or call 
for Palestinian statehood. Since 1945, a total of 36 UNSC draft resolutions related to Israel-Palestine have been vetoed by one of the five permanent members. The US, Russia, China, the United Kingdom and France. Out of these, 34 were vetoed by the US and two by Russia and China. The US has vetoed resolutions on Israel a total of 46 times, including over Israel's invasion of southern Lebanon as well as Israel's annexation of the Syrian Golan Heights, which remains under Israeli occupation. Washington formally recognized Israeli sovereignty in 2019 over the Golan Heights, reversing decades of US policy. The 1972 draft resolution, the only time the US did not veto, was brief and generic, calling upon all sides to seize immediately all military operations and to exercise the greatest restraint in the interest of international peace and security. Meanwhile, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was also caught in the crossfire for his comments on asking the international community to not see the recent developments in vacuum. It is important to also recognize the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. They have seen their land steadily devoured by settlements and plagued by violence. Their economy stifled, their people displaced, and their homes demolished. Their hopes for a political solution to their plight have been vanishing. But the grievances of the Palestinian people cannot justify the appalling attacks by Hamas, and those appalling attacks cannot justify the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. This led to a strong demand for his resignation. He was rounded up by Israeli officials who accused him of justifying terror. Secretary General, the UN was established to prevent atrocities, to prevent such atrocities like the barbaric atrocities that Hamas committed. But the UN is failing. The UN is failing. And you, Mr. Secretary General, have lost all morality and impartiality. Because when you say those terrible words that these heinous attacks did not happen in a vacuum, you are tolerating terrorism. This is a pure blood libel. This is a pure blood libel. And I think that the Secretary General must resign. Guterres felt the need to clarify his statement, which he said had been misinterpreted. I am shocked by the misrepresentations by some of my statement yesterday in the Security Council, as if, as if I was justifying acts of terror by Hamas. This is false. It was the opposite. I believe it was necessary to set the record straight, especially out of respect to the victims and to their families. After the Security Council failed on four occasions to reach consensus on any action, an emergency session of the UNGA was called, which saw the adoption of a non-binding Jordanian resolution by a large majority of member states with 120 votes in favor, 14 against, and 45 abstentions. Meanwhile, Israel hit back at the UN for not mentioning Hamas terror group during the resolution. Today is a day that will go down in inf infamy. We have all witnessed that the UN no longer holds even one ounce of legitimacy or relevance. This organization was founded in the wake of the Holocaust for the purpose of preventing atrocities. Yet, the spectacle we just saw proves beyond a doubt that the UN is committed, sadly, tragically, not to preventing but ensuring further atrocities. This marks the first formal response of the United Nations to the escalation of violence in Israel and Palestine since the Hamas terror attacks of 7th October. 
on Spotlight this weekend, we have an exclusive conversation with the European Union Ambassador to India, Ambassador Hervé Delphin. He spoke to us about the situation in Gaza, concerns of the European countries with regards to the humanitarian crisis, condemned the Hamas attack, but also called for a humanitarian pause to allow aid into Gaza. Listen in. This is his first interview to any news network here in India. A career spanning 30 years, specialist in international relations, I'm being joined by the new European Union ambassador to India, Ambassador Irve Delphin. Thank you so much for joining us here on India Today. Apart from the European war, now we have another front that has opened up uh, in the Middle East, which is what we call West Asia. How do you look at the Israel-Palestine war, uh, the Hamas attack, but also Israel's response to the attack? Hmm. Uh, first, it it's an absolute tragedy. I mean, there is no other word to describe it. Uh, um, the, what, ha what the, the terrorist attack of, of, of Hamas uh, against uh, uh, Israeli civilians is despicable. Uh, now, we stood uh, in solidarity with Israel, um, and, 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 and uh, we will stand by Israel to... Uh, uh, right to exist uh, in security uh, and, and um, in the future. And we have always been pushing and supporting a two-state solution as well. And that has been a long-term commitment of the EU. Uh, and we also want this to be uh, put back on the, on the top of the agenda. Uh, now, immediately, there is one absolute priority is to let humanitarian aid in Gaza um, I relate personally to this crisis because in my past I was uh, dealing with humanitarian aid for the EU. Um, I traveled a lot in the region, the West Bank, in Gaza. I, I know this place, I know the people, and I can imagine only the suffering of the civilians. So I think we need really to make sure that humanitarian aid gets in. A lot of efforts are made. EU is pushing for uh, um, unlocking the humanitarian access, finding if there is any solution in terms of humanitarian pools. We tripled our humanitarian assistance. Now it's about 78 million euro. And if you look, actually, EU and the EU and India are almost on the same page because we stood by in solidarity with Israel in front of the, the terrorist attack, and we at the same time want the, the civ bringing civilian uh, assistance to civilian people and we launched this uh, two-state solution agenda. The European Union had a foreign minister's meeting and they really failed in bringing, uh, bringing about a humanitarian pause for the aid to enter Gaza. Where do you see this entire, given that you've worked in that area, you know the lay of the land, where do you see it uh, head from here on? Um, the Rafah crossing is only allowing about 10 to 14 trucks, which is really not enough for the massive population in Gaza? Wherever, uh, whether in, in this crisis and or, or on others, when it comes to uh, humanitarian poles and humanitarian corridors or whatever the name you will dis use, um, there are different considerations that always come into play. There are different actors. Uh, we, EU, we do not control the gate of Rafah. Uh, we, we are in uh, intense uh, contact with all the parties to, to, to the situation. Um, Egypt play a crucial role, and they, they are really um, trying to make the, the best of this, of this situation. And I think it's important to realize also that there are security concerns on all parties. So I think the message of the UN Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, is fully supported, it's fully backed by the EU, and we support all efforts that are done in that respect. And that's where the EU stand uh, now, and, and we will provide uh, any support uh, we can to make sure that humanitarian aid uh, flows in. And what about uh, normalization of relations uh, between Israel and the Arab world? How do you see that, uh, or for that matter, easing of the situation in, um, in, this, in, in West Asia? 
I think we both India and the EU have, uh, have always had an interest, a strategic interest in having stability and security in this region. Everything that contributes to that I think is of importance and to return to, I would say, a positive agenda which is about growth, about green growth, about stability, connectivity. This is what we are all after. And if we can move from a situation of conflict and stability to that agenda, I think India and EU will be partners uh, and could work together to have that aim. Thank you so much for joining us here Thank on India Today. Thank you very much for your uh, interview, Mrs. Okay, now, it's clear that Iran now is front and center in this war. It's a well-known funder of Hamas, has been backing Hezbollah in Lebanon to open another front against Israel. And now... U.S. media is reporting that it was Iran that trained Hamas on its soil to mount the October 7th siege. This is a U.S. media report on the basis of U.S. intelligence. Shocking revelation by U.S. media, indicating a direct role of Iran in executing the terror strike on Israel. As per Wall Street Journal, the Hamas terrorists who attacked Israel on October 7th were trained by Iran's military and the Quds force. Iran even gave Hamas terrorists combat training. And over 500 Hamas terrorists took training in September, a month before the bloodiest attack. As per reports, Iran gave funds to Hamas before the attacks and even helped the terror group with weapons and technology. That terrorist meeting between the Hezbollah uh, chief uh, along with the deputy leaders of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Hamas in Beirut, uh, the fact that Israel continues to, uh, you know, conduct airstrikes, uh, airstrikes on uh, uh, Hezbollah positions. You know, a very indirect Iranian role is becoming more and more explicit. Iran's supreme leader sent out a stern warning to Israel, claiming it can never confront the Muslim forces. America is a definite accomplice of the criminals. In this crime, America's hands is covered with the blood of the oppressed, the children, the ill and the women up to the elbow. Since it couldn't overpower the fighters, it won't be able to outpower them in the future either. It's taking revenge on the defenseless and oppressed people and throwing bombs on them. Israel has repeatedly revealed that Iran is the key force behind the coordinated Hamas attacks, prompting the U.S. to back its right to self-defense. The United States does not seek conflict with Iran. We do not want this war to widen. But if Iran or its proxies attack U.S. personnel anywhere, we will defend our people, we will defend our security. You've got the leader of Iran coming out and, uh, you know, pretty much confirming common cause with these proxies, uh, as if to suggest that it is Iran, after all, that is the puppet master in all of this. Will the revelation of Iran's full role in the terror strikes lead to an Israel-Iran war? With Shivarur in Israel, Bureau Report, India Today. Countries in the Arab world are determined to stand by the cause of Palestine and have expressed concerns and worries with regards to Israeli action in Gaza. I spoke with Lebanon's ambassador to India, Ambassador Dr. Rabia Narsh, and this is what he had to say. Ambassador Hezbollah Chief Nasrallah just hosted uh, the Hamas deputy chief and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad's head, Ziad ul Nakhalla, in Beirut. Uh, if these meetings are taking place, what does it mean for uh, for Lebanon and Lebanon's own security? How much uh, how much uh, of a threat could this entire scenario be for Lebanon itself? Should even if there is no announcement, the fact that meetings have taken place, should Hezbollah as a militia group enter? this entire fray? 
It's not a secret that the resistance groups in the region, they, they coordinate. I am not aware of this meeting, and there's no, no statement uh, that mm -hmm. uh, came out of this meeting. So, I mean, it's just a meeting, so we don't know what, what, uh, what happened in the meeting, and we don't know the outcome of the meeting. Um, as as uh, government, like I, say, like I said, we are concerned, of course. Uh, but then again, uh, Hezbollah knows that, that uh, war is not a cakewalk for, for all parties, I mean, even for Israel also. Uh, the devastating repercussion of war, are, I mean, no one wants to go into this scenario. Uh, and let's hope that it will not happen. Right. Uh, again, just one final question before I move on to other uh, aspects. On Hezbollah itself and the Hamas, the fact that uh, th there have been meetings and uh, Lebanon it does not want to enter war, is there any communication and engagement in showing and ensuring that you do not enter the war at all? Uh, or is that, is that in the realm of possibility even today, given the fluid situation? And should there be massive aggression against Gaza? against the West Bank, then what will Lebanon do? Yes, of course, the, the talks are, are always there. Like I said, uh, Hezbollah is part of the government, maybe indirectly, but also part of the Lebanese politics as a whole. They, are, they have members in the parliament, and they are always, I mean, on daily basis, the talks. And our prime minister has announced that they, he contacted uh, Hezbollah officials and our uh, foreign minister also. So, but there's no guarantee. I mean, who can guarantee? Because the, the situation is in Israel's hand, is in the powerful party hand. So you don't ask Hezbollah uh, if we don't want war. Don't ask Hezbollah to step aside and, and stay calm. You have to ask the, the powerful party. You have to ask Israel not to escalate, not to provoke. Israel has been provoking, I think, as if they wanted this war. Mm. Um, one journalist, unfortunately, from on the Lebanese side, Lebanese journalist has been killed by Israeli direct shots. Uh, civilians have been killed, the homes have been targeted. So, so, I mean, if we don't want this war, we are doing our best, we are trying uh, w what we can do, we are doing what we can do. But the, the ball now is in Israeli court. They should restrain themselves, they should, because they have, like I said, they have weapons of mass destruction, they, they, present, uh, they present themselves as the, I don't know, fourth or fifth most powerful army in the world. They have nuclear uh, uh, weapons. Um, we, we see the, the devastating powers on Gaza. They are trying new weapons, white phosphorus. So, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not in our hand. Plus, uh, you know, of course, Gita, you, your viewers ha have to know that um, this societal connection in the Arab world, and especially Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, all the Arab world, the, the, the familial and societal links is so strong. That's true. Uh, so, I mean, if, if something happened to Gaza, it's not like only a neighboring country. It's like attacking your, your own home or your brother's home. I gave an example earlier that uh, as if, uh, God forbidden, that something, happened, something bad happened to an Indian in southern India, or on South India, then uh, an, Indian, uh, an Indian here in North India would feel sorry and would feel like he is concerned, right? So the same here. Uh, that's why n there's no guarantee, and no one can guarantee how the emotion or how the th things develop. Uh, of course, now the, um, uh, every Arab, they feel like, uh, of course, angry and frustrated, and, but then again, the restraint is there, and the powerful party, like I said, Israel, should, do, uh, should take the initiative, not the poor Palestinians. At a time when the world is closely watching the horrific images of war that is unfolding in Israel and Palestine, I'm ending this show with the powerful lines from a poem written by the famous Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, which highlights the futility of war, titled, The War Will End. The war will end. The leaders will shake hands. The old woman will keep waiting for her martyred son. That girl will wait for her beloved husband. And those children will wait for their hero father. I don't know who sold our homeland, but I saw who paid the price. Goodbye and take care.